Welcome to part two, chapter two of my masterclass on the Sicilian dragon. Today we're going to be focusing on the Yugoslav attack with nine castles. I will, of course, be attaching a PGN for everything that you're about to see in this opening. I will leave that in the description. So if you have chess base, chessable, lee chess, if you want to put that into anything for you to be able to study the moves and study the theory, I highly recommend you do that. And if you have any questions about moves maybe that I didn't cover or something that maybe uh, you were still wondering about, then of course leave it in the comments below. Let's jump in to the theory. The Yugoslav attack is e4, c5, knight f3, d6, now d4 takes, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3, g6. And I talked about in part one of this masterclass the choices that white has here. The Yugoslav is the move bishop e3, which is by far the most critical. This is one of the two chapters that you really need to focus on, uh, maybe even memorizing the moves, uh, because this is very common, and also it's the most important in the sense of objectivity. If you don't play this correctly, white is simply going to be better because they are going to be coming quickly with an attack. So we go bishop g7 here. Now f3, I do want to remember, remind you guys one more time, do not fall into this trap of going knight g4 here, targeting the bishop. The idea is correct, but the execution not so much. Here they have this check, and after we block, queen takes knight, this bishop is pinned, and white is going to be up a piece. So instead, we simply develop. Now here, they play f3. If they don't play f3, let's say they move their queen, now this idea does come into play and we're going to try to win this bishop. But they're going to play f3 to stop that. We castle, they go queen to d2, we develop our knight to c6, the golden square for the knight, and here they have to make a choice. Now in this video we are going to be covering the option of playing long castles here uh, on move 9. In the next chapter we are looking at bishop c4, which I think is just as important and you're probably going to see this move just as often because this is a really juicy diagonal for the bishop. Now, long castles, as opposed to bishop to c4, allows this move d5. And this is the move we play. We immediately strike in the center, looking to open up the position for our pieces. Now here, there is, of course, a number of moves that they can play. The main line uh, is them basically just trading off uh, starting with e takes d5. They can also change the move order, which might be a little tricky by playing knight takes c6 here. They can play queen to e1, trying to unleash the rook on this attack on the queen in the future. And the final option we'll look at here is king to b1. The king often moves here uh, at some point in the game because the king now defends all these three pawns. The king is typically just safer on b1, so this is a, a move that you might see in this position. Now, we're going to be starting by looking at this move queen to e1. Here we strike immediately. We go e5. We try to take as much control in the center as possible. Now, after knight takes, which is more or less forced, I mean, they can try to do something else, like retreating, uh, noticing that the rook is now eyeing the, uh, the queen. This was their idea by moving the queen. Um, and even though we're not winning a piece here because they can simply move their bishop, for example, and we can't take because we lose the queen, we're still in a super happy position. We can simply develop our bishop, something like bishop e6, and well, all of our pieces are really happy here. Uh, this is a really nice diagonal. We have full control in the center. And I mean, we've, we've just totally taken over here. So this is absolutely not what uh, white wants to do, especially considering the fact that something like queen a5 is coming, uh, which will come with tempo because now the knight is going to be untacked and also we're going to be pressuring a2. So to avoid this, uh, by far, they're going to take here uh, more often than not. Now, here we simply take back, of course, and the most challenging response is taking in the center again, again not giving us this ability to simply push and gain a lot of space and this beautiful diagonal. So they take. Now here, this is probably uh, where a lot of you 
will blunder because the most natural move is, of course, to play c takes d5, uh, which unfortunately loses. And the issue is our center is really beautiful, but it's not stable enough. And here they can start by playing bishop g5, pinning the knight to the queen, and this pawn is now under some heavy fire. We can defend it one more time, but after this really brilliant move, bishop c4, it's attacked uh, once again. Of course, we can't take because of the pin. The whole point of queen to e1 is for the rook to shine, and in this line, it definitely does. And unfortunately, it's really hard to uh, stay in control here. So the move we want to play, we unfortunately cannot, but that's not the biggest deal because knight takes d5 still leaves us in a really pleasant position. As you can see from the arrows, we have various ideas here. The queen often sits on c7, where it's really safe and untouchable, and whenever this position opens up, something like knight takes, pawn takes, the queen will be targeting the king. Uh, the bishop develops often simply to e6. Again, we have this really nice long diagonal. The rook often comes to e8, and at some point we expand with f5, playing uh, all over the board, gaining a lot of space, and, I mean, this is a really fine position for black. So that was queen to e1. As we just saw, they're trying to open up the rook, but the move e5 really comfortably expands for black in the center. So let's look at a second sideline, king to b1. Here we start by taking this really nice centralized knight here. And usually they will take back. I mean, taking with the queen just visually seems horrible, it's lining up the queen with the bishop, and tactics are going to be on the horizon, including ideas uh, such as knight takes e4. Um, and so instead, they take with the bishop. A very quick move that I do just want to uh, show is e5, which is possible. Of course, we're up a piece, but now they're attacking two of the pieces, and they're trying to expand uh, and just throw us off our shoes. But this, of course, just doesn't work at all. I mean, it's playable. Actually, I shouldn't say it doesn't work at all. It's totally fine uh, for white. But what I meant is that it's not that dangerous for us. We can play knight to f5 here, saving our knight, attacking their bishop. Of course, if they move their bishop, we move our knight and we're up a piece. So they more or less have to take. And here we have a nice decision as to what piece we want to take with. I'm recommending e takes f6. Uh, and after knight takes here, we play knight takes e3, queen takes, and bishop e6, as it turns out, uh, for the moment, this uh, this pin is not dangerous at all, um, and our bishop gets to a really nice diagonal. At some point, we play f5, so something like bishop c4, now f5, and the bishop is going to be opened up as well. So that is one way to play. It's my recommendation, but I do also want to mention, to make this more complete, if you don't like that position, there's a really cool and interesting uh, possibility for you. Bishop takes f6 here, and after knight takes d5, queen takes d5. This is a very nice queen sacrifice. Now, uh, I haven't put my engine on this for too long, uh, but it was saying around plus one for white. But you can definitely see after bishop f5, black, um, if the black hasn't equalized, at the very least, they have really good chances here. I mean, the bishops are so powerful. There's definitely m enough compensation here for black. Uh, and when the bishop lands here to combat this one, it might get hit by this pin. And so if you are interested in playing this sort of variation, perhaps you want to investigate this uh, endgame or this position a bit further. But this recommendation with e takes f6 leaves you in a really comfortable and more balanced position material wise. So those are your options after the move e5. Uh, but definitely more critical is bishop takes d4 here. Here we continue by taking, and after pawn takes, we play bishop e6. And we have a very nice, pleasant position. Just to show you how this kind of can develop some of the uh, I, I, ways to continue our developments, the queen very often, as you'll see in future chapters as well, comes out to a5 here, where it's really powerful, especially noticing this attack on a2. And what you're going to notice here is that this bishop becomes a really nice piece. Typically, this is the dragon bishop, but the way that I have this uh, opening set up, both of our bishops are incredibly powerful. Now, knight d5 um, is one of the benefits of the fact that the king moved, where this doesn't come with check, and so their idea is after queen takes queen, they want to take here with check, um, and after we move our king, they want to take, 
this tactic does sometimes work, but here it doesn't work because we have uh, a very nice move. Knight takes e4, and after, um, I mean, it obviously depends what they do, but this is attacked, this is attacked, logical is to take here, and after king takes, uh, we won back the material, our knight is centralized, and this knight is very much looking trapped here. Uh, whether or not we win it depends on what they play here, but at the very least, we've definitely equalized, activated our pieces. This is by no means um, what white wants to do. Um, and so, you know, instead, they're probably going to try to develop, maybe launch an attack, but that's not an issue for us as w at all. We have this pressure. Our rooks find really good files here. At some point, we can maneuver this knight and open up this bishop, and black has a totally fine game here. And so that covers, for the most part, king b1 and queen to e1. We have now the main lines to look at. And although these are the main lines, ironically, they're not even the trickiest. I think these sidelines are more tricky. So here, pawn takes is the main line. And after we play knight takes, knight takes, pawn takes, they basically trade everything. We get into this endgame that I showed in the introduction, uh, where we play queen to c7. We're going to return to this in a moment, but I just want to show you this so we can compare this to what if they start with this sideline, knight takes c6. Here after pawn takes, pawn takes, we play, of course, uh, knight takes. And if, I mean, we basically just transposed fully into the main line. And so for that reason, uh, this sideline of starting with knight takes here on c6 and then playing e takes d5 is not dangerous at all. The only small thing to uh, see is this move e5 here, which they can try to switch up the move order. But this is not dangerous because we've totally taken control of the center. And after we move the knight, does it look a little ugly right now? Sure, but you'll see with f6 we get totally uh, fine control. Our center is nice. Our pieces will open up very quickly, and we're going to maneuver uh, the pieces back into the game. The queen will land somewhere useful. The bishop as well. You can see some really nice light square potential, and the rook also has this open b file. And of course, don't forget about the knight. The knight will come in either via f6 if they take, um, or alternatively, you can also try to maneuver it via c7. And so, uh, starting with this seemingly tricky move, knight takes c6, doesn't really uh, amount to anything, so we're going to focus on e takes d5, knight takes d5, knight takes pawn takes, and here um, knight takes back on d5. They do have, for example, a move like bishop d4 here, which is, I mean, at the top level, something you probably will see. This was uh, actually, funnily enough, one of the moves that put the dragon out of fashion because people thought that white is really comfortable here. Here we play e5. We obviously don't want to play bishop to uh, takes d4. It's possible. Um, and, and then trying to go for this trade. It's not my recommendation because I think it really makes the position a bit more boring. Obviously, if they get greedy, then we're going to win back some of the material, uh, specifically this a pawn. Um, and so they're not going to win material, but I find these positions to be a bit more boring without this bishop here. But it is a way to play um, if they go for bishop to d4, but I recommend e5. And after bishop c5, I mean, if they just retreat somewhere random, then of course we are very happy to just develop. And I mean, this is no issue for us at all. Bishop c5 is the critical move. And now we go rook e8. Again, I want to offer an alternative, which is bishop e6 here. Uh, which is possible, sacrificing the rook. This is, uh, for, for the longest time, been considered the main variation even that black goes for. And basically, black is getting a nice center um, and good bishops as compensation for it. Totally playable if you want to give it a go. Um, but I think that more solid and more safe is rook e8. And we're going to try to expand with f5 um, and develop our pieces really comfortably. If they take, for example... We get a very nice center, and just to show you a variation, they can win a pawn, but again, our bishop develops, and I mean, from here, we can take the pawn immediately, then launch our pawn. They're not going to be able to win the bishop, because here we even have this nice tactic. Um, and, I mean, alternatively, we just develop our rook. The c-file looks nice. 
we can launch our pawn here. The other rook can also come via the b file, especially with this bishop. This is totally fine. So instead, in this position, instead of knight takes d5, they play knight e4. And now we go queen to c7, and after knight to d6, it might seem like this knight is really annoying here, which in many ways it is, but we move our rook, and um, if they don't take, we are obviously going to take. So the knight is annoying, but it's only, uh, I mean, it's very, very temporary. We simply trade it off for the bishop, and now we land into a super pleasant position. I mean, e4 comes even at the expense of a pawn. We open up the bishop, the rook comes to this, and just to show you a nice uh, tactical idea, if they get greedy, then uh, checkmate is on the horizon in a really beautiful manner. Okay, so all of that shows that bishop d4, although very theoretical and possible, is not that dangerous. Instead, knight takes d5 is the main move. We play pawn takes d5, and we get into this really interesting position. We go queen to c7, now, if they take on a8, then of course we develop our bishop and we go into this endgame where we're threatening checkmate, we're threatening the queen they have to take. Um, and after king takes f8, this is fine for white, but practically black has all the fun here. These open bishops give black really good play. At some point, you want to stop all of these uh, attacking potentials that white has by just going h5 uh, at the right moment. In fact, after they develop their bishop, h5 is, is a move that you very often play as your next move. And aside from that, I mean, we basically just continue uh, attacking on these open files with the bishops. I'll show you some variations. Let's say they go rook d2. Um, that's basically one of their only options aside from bishop d3 because they have to stop checkmate in one. Uh, so let's start with rook d2. Here we can go queen to b8. They go b3. We go h5, immobilizing their uh, attack on the king side. Let's say they develop. We now really cement this bishop inside and then go queen to e5. And I mean, you can see, okay, first of all, these checks are really not important. At some point, they have to move their king to try to keep it as safe as possible. And now we go queen to c5. And by playing b3, they've greatly weakened these dark squares. And that's basically where we plan to attack. So although this isn't too decisive, this position, we get really good attacking potential. Uh, same thing with bishop d3 for the most part. I mean, we can go queen to e5 here instead. Of course, we don't want to trade pieces because that will take away from our attack. We're threatening to infiltrate, so uh, they more or less have to move their king to d2. I mean, they can play bishop e4 and try to uh, hold on. The idea is threatening checkmate, but of course we take their king moved, and, well, they're no longer threatening checkmate, and here we can simply go and trade into a very pleasant position. So instead, after queen to e5, uh, king to d2 is more or less forced. Now we can take, for example, if they take like this, we infiltrate. Um, and if they instead take king takes, now we can give this check. You can see how exposed the king is, We're cutting it off on every single, uh, on every single diagonal. And we have all the fun here. So really, regardless on how they choose to defend this pawn, we're going to get some really good attacking chances from these various avenues. And so this endgame is, for the most part, seen as a really pleasant um, and, again, practically really good endgame for black to enter. Um, and so instead of this, white can try to avoid and not take on a8, for example, queen to c5, but this is not so scary. Uh, of course, we don't want to trade, so we simply move the queen to b7. Now they can go, for example, uh, of course, they had to defend here, so they'll go to a3. We develop our bishop, and from here, the game plan is rather simple. We get the rooks onto some meaningful files. The bishops are super powerful here, and uh, I mean, this is totally fine for black. So regardless on what they play, if they go into this main line, we get some really fun positions where, as you saw, their attack is nowhere to be seen. Our attack is um, unavoidable. And so these sort of positions are pretty, pretty good for black. And that, for the most part, covers everything. Just as a quick recap, um, if they go king to b1, we take here 
and after bishop takes, we continue by taking here as well, and after pawn takes, don't forget, we simply develop, and we have a really pleasant and easy position. If they go queen to e1, this allows us to expand, and after the knight move, expand again, getting the bishop in as well, super powerful diagonal, super good space in the center, super good position. And uh, aside from that, the raw options really are just trading here in the center in some sort of uh, way, in some sort of move order. So something like knight takes, pawn takes, pawn takes, uh, knight takes, knight takes, pawn takes, queen takes. And this is the variation we just saw with queen c7. I just talked about this. If they take, we get this really nice endgame. Uh, and if they don't take, then we still get all the benefits of these open files and diagonals. Um, and more material is on the board, which typically benefits the attacker. So these variations, although super critical and important to know, are not necessarily bad for black. Um, as a matter of fact, I think these are really fun and good positions for black to play because, well, I haven't seen any sort of attack from white in these uh, theoretical moves, and this is just a really good and easy position to play. So that is the Yugoslav attack with castles on move 9. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Subscribe for more content like this. Stay tuned for the rest of this series, and I will see you next time. Peace out.